So he stands there. He did not first ask for miracles. That's where we got it wrong. He didn't begin by asking for miracles. He began by saying, we want boldness to preach your word. Now, everybody look at me because this part is so essential. God has a message for California. Look at me. God has a message for California that will make the lame to walk, the blind to see, the deaf to hear, that will deliver the addict, that will turn your church around. God has a message. God has a new word, a fresh word, a living word, a powerful, I'm going to blow up here in a minute. God has a word that will shake the very timbers of hell, that will bring power to your people, that will absolutely break every chain. What Peter wanted was to tell God, I don't care what it costs me personally, the message you are bringing to Israel and the world in the first century, I am going to bring it boldly without any withdrawal. Look what Acts 5, the angel said to them, stand together in the center of the town and tell the people all the words of this life. Do you realize what a wickedness it is when a church says our pattern is never to quote more than two verses in a sermon because it offends the outsider who can't take it. It's a lie from the pit of hell. Now look, I understand that there are boring preachers that quote a lot of verses and they've got no life. I know some that are so boring if they explain kissing to junior high students, they'd never do it. But now, on the other hand, that's because there's no fire on them. There's nothing more powerful than when the anointing comes on a preacher. When a man or a woman stands there under the fire of God, quoting the word of God, it, it's unstoppable. Am I right? It's the message. It's the message. You have no idea. How many of your problems in church growth would be solved if you would repent of your disobedience about what you're preaching about? Because you're not telling the people what God told you to tell them. You're telling them something else. Well, I lose people. And I'll never forget this pastor walked up to me and he said, Mario, you used to be a man of God. Now you're nothing but a politician. So I looked at him and I said, uh, can I ask you, why aren't you preaching against abortion? Why aren't you defending biblical marriage? Well, I would lose tithers, he said to me. I said, you mean votes? I said, who's the politician? So now let me ask you here. When, when you listen to someone else tell you what to preach on after God told you what to preach on? And then here, here's how you do. You, you know, you ask God to give you miracles when you're disobeying what he wants you to preach. So I'm going to close with one last story. That was wonderful. You know, that was just wonderful. I'm 19 years old and I get a letter to go to preach for Phil Johnson in Evangelistic Tabernacle in Vancouver, British Columbia. He said, we're gonna have a great meeting, please come up and preach. So this was in the day before a lot of things. We did have fire and wheels. So I flew up there and I landed and Phil Johnson looked at me and he said, uh, you look a lot younger in person than you do in your pictures. And he said, you are more a Cirillo, aren't you?
Now, the only way that I can get confused like that is if there's a resurrection, you see. But there I was, standing in the airport. And I said, who? He said, well, you are Morris Murillo. No, I'm Mario Murillo. And you got to understand people from Oklahoma. If you've never met people from Oklahoma, <laughs> Will Rogers is a good model. And, you know, they're kind of like, you know, well, son, you're not Morris Cirillo, right? Nope. He said, uh, well, do you have a healing ministry? I said, no. He nods his head, well, okay. Uh, we've got like 12 busloads of people coming from all over Western Canada tonight. We have a deaf section and a wheelchair section. So I remember there was a hotel called the Blue Boy Hotel. They took us over there. He took me over. And I'm going up the elevator. He's very quiet. And he's just looking at me. He's taking it all in. And we get to the door, and he opens the door, right? He hands me my key, opens the door. We had keys back then. And so he opens the door, puts my luggage in the ent entryway of the hotel room, and then I step in, and he's about to close the door. He said, son, are you sure you don't have a healing ministry? I said, no, it don't. And then he's slowly closing the door like only an Oklahoman could do. And he goes, well, son, you better have one by 7 o'clock. <laughs> you don't tell people how to do it. You just tell them to do it. I'm pacing back and forth in that hotel room. I'm on my knees, I'm on my face, I'm staring at, I'm eating carpet and I'm staring at the ceiling. I'm throwing chairs around, I'm fighting. And suddenly, near 6.15, the Lord says, if you'll preach what I tell you to preach, you'll see miracles. I said, well, that's awesome, okay. Uh, what do you want me to preach on? He said, don't preach on healing. You're not. I said, wait, what? No, he said, these people need to repent. And I brought you here. I tricked you into being in this situation. N so that you would learn to always preach what I tell you to preach, no matter what the consequence. It went over like a pregnant pole vaulter when the pastor announces, we don't have Morris Cirillo here tonight. We have Mario Murillo here. And I heard this lady, she, was, she couldn't, what? What did he just say? I maybe like to know what happened. Raise your hand, would you? All right, it's taking way too long. So I stood up there and had him sing. Sing it again. In case you wondered why we do that, now you know. Sing it again. I'm trying to see where the exits are. I, I don't know how many times I had him sing that again. And I look at the pastor and he's changing color. And the people are there and it is like cringe, cringe. And, I, and I, I'm standing there and I said, okay, now I'm gonna preach. I went ahead and delivered the word that God gave me. Felt nothing. Got nowhere. It was an oil painting. It wasn't an audience. And I had faithfully delivered everything that God told me to deliver. 
And when I was done, I said, sing it again. Because <laughs> by now I know you know it. And it's over for me, right? It's over. It's packed out. I'm done. I'm toast. I, I give it up. And all of a sudden, a man in the back starts screaming. I was thrilled. I didn't care if it was a demon, a heckler. What did I care? They were all looking at him. So that man runs down the side aisle, up on the stage. I still don't care. He stands 10 feet away from me and begins to grab his toes and reach for heaven and grab his toes. And I turn around, and the pastor is openly sobbing. And I know this is good. This is way better. I mean, this is okay now. Pastor walks over, puts his arm around this man, and he, he takes the mic out of my hand. He said, all of you know this elder in our church. He's a veteran of the Second World War with shrapnel in his spine. He said, tell him what you go through every day. And he says, I cannot sleep at night until after I've soaked in a tub for two hours every night. No medication takes away my pain. He said, nothing works on me. And he said, they can't operate because the metal is in my spinal cord. And he said, when, when this man finished preaching, this power went through my body. Somebody get excited. Right? You, you need to help me a little. This power went through my body. And I have no pain for the first time in 30 years. How many of you are ready for power? How many of you are ready for power? <laughs>